So Mark Bishop, host of the Mark Bishop Show and Nothing Like a Good Book podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Junkies. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been following you for years. <laughs> <laughs> We've chatted over emails and God knows what else, but no, it's a pleasure to be on and Podcast Junkies. Gee, you've been going a while now with that. Yeah, since 2014. 322 will be published tomorrow. <laughs> You were about 22 ahead of me. Good job. <laughs> well done. I think one of the last ones I heard is you were in a restaurant interviewing somebody. Oh, that maybe. was a while back. Okay, yeah. that must have been a while back, though. So yeah. when did the podcasting journey start for you? Well, Harry, four years now. Okay. Four years ago, I was doing a talkback show here in Tucson, where I live, and for a local AM station, a radio station. And after six months of it, I was producing a show and getting guests and racing out afterwards to try and get clients and uh, to sponsor the show and all that type of thing. Yeah. And I'd had enough of it. I'd, I'd had years of it before. And they used to pay me for the talent. And, and to go out now and have to do all of that, then give 50% of it to a station. I, <laughs> I, I thought something's wrong with this equation. So it was uh, too much to do. I'd already retired. I came back into it because I missed the media mm. terribly. And as anybody would understand, if uh, they've been in the game for a while, so I started up the studio downtown. I thought podcasting was going to be the future. Yeah. And I teach people downtown, uh, businesses and what have you, run their own shows. But I also love to still do my own interviews and my own shows as well. So, yeah, four years I've been running now. And where is the studio located? It's in downtown, in Tucson itself. Okay. Uh, it's in the Stewart Title and Trust corporate offices. And I've got it up there on the second floor on Broadway. About as close as I'll ever get to Broadway. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I've been there four years now, and it's rather hot in Tucson. <laughs> That's right. We were just... I like to stay home when I can. <laughs> yeah. We were recording this in July of 2023, and I, I think you said the temperature reached 122, is it you said? Not here, okay. uh, Phoenix, yeah. yes, but uh, about 111 today. We've come down a bit. You know, that's why it's nice when I'm up early in the morning and I do my early morning interviews back east. Yeah. yeah because yeah. the three hours difference is, you know, for the Mark Bishop show, that's it. Yeah. And if the day finished then, it'd be good. <laughs> Go play more golf. Can you even play golf in this weather? It's, yeah, it's too hot. It's this, too this is summer. Yeah. Yes, it's too hot. Is this the yeah, hottest? Is too hot. How long have you been in Tucson? This time around, 12 years. 12 years. And before that, I was in Phoenix. I had my company in Phoenix where okay. I was marketing uh, TV and you could go cook an egg on the road, you know, for lunch. <laughs> I mean, at 111 well, <laughs> degrees, I think people can actually try this now because it's crazy. That's right. Have it's, you ever seen it? Do you, do you remember it ever getting this hot? No. I knew it was coming though, right? No yeah. one's been listening to, you know, the global, uh, what he said. Yeah. We've got to do something. But anyway. Well, you're based in California. I'm in Minneapolis now. Moved. Yeah, oh, yeah, you've yeah, moved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mini mini. Huh? Yeah. Nice. It's nice. Yeah, it gets to. It was 91 today, so it's not exactly that, oh, yeah, that cool nice. here. But the winters definitely get just as cold as it gets hot here during the summer. So I'm getting. So, I'm getting the full range of it. But it's nice uh -huh. to be just outside the city and uh, a little All bit right. of nature. There's some deers that come onto the property, some turkeys, and so I'm getting the full. Not quite uh, homesteading, but it is nice to get a an opportunity to slow down, which is nice. A semi-farmer, huh? Yeah. Living in luxury out on them, <laughs> them dear hills. <laughs> and we had our neighbor take a vacation, and we had to watch their chickens and let the chickens out in the coop and everything. So, <laughs> Very nice of you. Yeah. Very nice of you. Well, you've done well. Good on you. <laughs> Go back. Let's wind the clock a little bit back. How did you get started in radio? Well, as a young fellow in Australia, I went to night school. Okay. I went to a particular a place called the Lee Murray Players. He was a very successful media man and radio announcer and producer himself over many years. And I went to school something like five nights a week for wow. four and a half years. <laughs> and finally I got in. I was only a young fellow, about 19 and a half. And you have to start in the country. Yeah. And you got to work your way. Get your stripes, as they say. Yeah, yeah. And then country provincial then cap city okay. you know yeah then at 26 i wanted to do television so they said well off you go you got to start all over oh, again yeah. <laughs> but i was very fortunate harry i didn't have to go to a real hit country town to start i got my break in a big regional center so they taught you everything you know it was amazing and i think there's a lot of similarities with radio and television and i think if you can fly into it 
which I did. I thoroughly loved it and enjoyed it. But, you know, there's still parts of radio, i.e. podcasting, that you don't get in television, you know. If you can remember back to what the original draw was that pulled you into want to dedicate that much time to learning that craft, can you think about what that was? Well, even as a kid, other than coming home from the movies and the matinee on a Saturday afternoon in Melbourne, Australia, and putting a cape on and jumping off the woodshed playing Superman or Batman or Hopalong Cassidy, that was wanting to be an actor. I don't know how on earth I ended up at radio school, but I did. I think one of my buddies was going at the time. And and then once I started it, I just loved it. I knew I had to get into it. I knew I had to do well in it, you know, attack it properly, give it all I could, learn everything I could. And my favorite shows were like Breakfast or a talk back show. Okay. All sporting on a Saturday afternoon, six state racing and football, you know, yeah. one state in this year and another state in that year. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, you know, achieving a dream, sticking to it. Yeah. Where did you learn that work ethic? Where did it come from? I don't know. It was the same at school. Maybe my grandfather, in fairness, God bless his soul. He was an A-grade electrical engineer, but his hobby was buying old homes, building them up, cleaning them up, making them lovely, and then we'd move on again. So consequently, I lived with my grandparents, my mom, and I used to clean bricks for him and hand him the saw when he wanted it or the the hammer or whatever, and I was determined not to be a trades guy. <laughs> he wanted me to be one, but it wasn't for me. I respect horses for courses, you know. Yeah. And he never really understood what I wanted to do, why I wanted to be an announcer, why I wanted to get into radio, and all those nights, you know, I would stick at that and go to school, have a work during the day and go yeah. to school at night. But until before he died, before he passed, he actually came to my very first station. And I was doing that sport. It was 2AY in Albury up in the country out of uh, Melbourne, um, a twin city between Wodonga and Albury between Melbourne and Sydney. If okay. you had to get over there. Anyway, long story short, he came into the studio with my grandma and my mom and he saw the effort and the work and the sweat pouring out of my face, <laughs> what I was going through. And from then on, he really appreciated what I did. That's great. And he really appreciated and respected and always let me know he was very proud of me. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. So that was nice, you know what I mean? Because my dad had died in the war, so he was like my father, you know. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, to see. Yeah. But I think it sounds like you, what you took from your grandfather was really the work ethic. I think that was it, and that's why I was sharing that. I think you're right. Yeah. And... So I'm grateful for more than one thing, you know what I mean? But yeah. uh, I think that was the part of it all. Yes, yes, the work ethic. Because when you do get in, then you got to work. Were there people in radio that you were listening to that you admired? Oh, very much so. In fact, a lot of the guys I went to school with in radio school, you know, they all went on. Not all of them, but a lot of them went on and worked in stations around Australia. And you'd bump into them occasionally. Some of them went to television. But when I was in Melbourne at the time, in answering your question, very good question, actually, uh, I did have idols actually on television reading the news. Okay. Channel 9 and Channel 7. And a long story short, years later, when I finally made it back in Melbourne, my hometown, what we call the big league, I was reading news of an evening, prime news, and I actually bumped off those guys in the radio. <laughs> that was the biggest thrill That's of my great. life. That's great. You know, it was a miracle. Yeah. So there we go. What uh, would you say your time in obviously learning the basics, you learn the ropes of what to do technically, but then once you had the broadcasting job and you were moving up the ranks, what were the skills that you were acquiring that was helping you? You know, is it communication skills or the ability to tell a story? Can you kind of articulate what is it that you were improving on when it comes to, to radio? I think it was confidence more than anything, mm. believe it or not. I can be an introvert yeah. and I'd be very shy at parties and things like that, you know, until I got whacked or something, but, <laughs> and that's not whacked in America. That's something completely different. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, a, a little too much. Inebriated. Of, yeah, inebriated, that's it. Yeah, yeah. You get whacked, you, know, you get whacked in the States. That's a mafia term for, uh, that's the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <the> end of <laughs> well, there's quite a few of those I could share with I'm you, sure. which were quite funny, but, no, I think the drive to succeed, to do better, communications, learning how to add a little bit any time on the spot, no matter what you had to do, which came in very handy for television because 
you know, if you lost the link or something else happened. I remember once I was working in Townsville, way up on the north coast of Australia, and it was the season for hurricanes, which we have between... No, not hurricanes. You have hurricanes. We have hurricanes here in America. They're called Tiro, dear, cyclones in Cyc Australia. Okay. Yeah. All right. And our season there is 12, is around about December through to March. And I was on a break on a holiday on an island way out. And this cyclone came and they raced me back to the channel to ad lib for a while about the weather where it was. And I had a, a football jacket on. I hadn't shaved for a couple of days. I was. The seas coming back were very scary. But when I think back, that's a time where you learned all that ad lib stuff, all that stuff that you had to think about very quickly and take it from here to here and get it out. And another time was I was hosting the cricket of all things from England in a Melbourne studio and the link went. And I think I had lived for about two hours. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was a lot. And I was looking for people to drag in, but there was nobody around at two in the morning. <laughs> so I told jokes and shared things and anything else I could. Oh, look at this. It's a box. You know what a box is made of? <laughs> that's a good, it's an opportunity to think on your feet. And then that's a, probably an, an important skill to have. It is. And particularly with interviewing, because I treat podcasting very much the way that I did radio. Yeah. And I teach uh, my students to, to be very, either work or don't do it. Mm. You know, there's no halfway measure. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, if you meet people who wouldn't work at an iron lung, Harry, you're not going to get them to do what you want them or need them to do if they don't really want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they have to and, have the drive. and you've got to have the drive and put the work into it, the effort into it. Even for me, I mean, I still prepare every interview. It might take two hours. I don't care. I want to get it right, the research right. Do what you got to do because you never know who's going to listen. Yes. That's the beauty of podcasting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you go everywhere, right? And you never know. I mean, I get emails and letters from, I'm surprised overseas, really, but you just never know who's going to pick it up. And it's nice to entertain people. And mm -hmm. I like to get the best out of people that I can mm. for the interview because they've got a story to tell. Yeah, right? of course. And the more you can share with people, I think, Harry, the more people learn, the more they have hope, yes. you know, because we've been going through a rough time, haven't we? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, last few years. Wow. Well, I tell you what. And now we've got weather, you know, but the aliens will be here soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that it's con officially confirmed for everyone, I think it's something that most people actually suspected or already knew. And I think it hopefully gives people who were seen as lunatics or on the fringe some validation because, you know, I think we all knew. And I wonder how what it's like for the people who were vehemently opposed to it or, or really convinced that that was not the case. And as we know, That's with right. all things government related, you know, there's the truth always comes out. Well, my friend, until they actually land on <laughs> the White House lawn, I guess, and you and I get a chance to yeah. race up and do an interview with them. Yeah. Uh, no one will ever believe us, you know, yeah. but I've, there's already been one here for ages. You know oh, yeah. That, don't you? Yeah. The, the, you know, who am I referring to? In the States, you mean? Yes. <laughs> the guy has to be an alien, my friend. He can't. <laughs> he works, you know, 44 hours a day. Yeah. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. With, Tesla. Yeah. yeah he's, a, he's a little, <laughs> he's a strange one for sure. Oh, he's a genius, mate. Yeah. I really do believe he's an absolute genius. His IQ is, you know, yeah. he's. That's why I call him jokingly and nicely, sir. Yeah. Don't sue me, Mr. <laughs> Alien. I wouldn't mind working for him. You'd learn a hell of a lot, to be honest. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you got to deal with his temperament, I'm sure. He's cut from a different cloth. Have you ever met him? No, I haven't, no. Neither have I. I'd no. like to, though. Yeah. That's I'd like to. What was the biggest difference when you made the jump from radio to TV? Depending on other people. Oh, interesting. Can and that's see? the part of television I don't like. Mm. But you've got to like it if you want to go to air. Yeah. The beautiful thing about working in radio and not even here in the States, you have what we call board guys. Okay. We never had that in Australia. You did everything yourself. Yeah. You went to air, you prepared your carts, you prepared everything you needed for your ads, all your promos. You had your vinyl when it was vinyl. Then you had your other discs and D whatever DVDs, right? But yeah. you prepared it all. You got it all ready because the buck stopped with you. Now you've got your, you know, your program director's directions, everything else you're supposed to do, and so on and so on. But you go to air with it, you're operating it, and you're at one with it. When it comes to television, okay, you're lucky enough if you're working with professionals to have a makeup lady, right? Yeah. As you can see, I sure don't have one now. <laughs> but the 
reality, and I can't do it properly because it was too heavy. Yeah. But not only that, you get to the studio, you'd have people give you the, I would get the news an hour beforehand and practice and go through it all. But really, once you sit in that studio and if you're doing news or whether you're hosting a show, now everybody else comes into play. And it's a great thing if you're a team and you're working together and, you've, and it goes smoothly, there's nothing better. But if you're, you know, counting on people to bring you in at a certain time, or at least you're talking away and there's no volume for the audio, mm. right? Or you're mentioning or you've thrown to a particular clip for news and it's not there. They put the wrong clip up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're the things. You wear them. It's part of the game. Yeah. But you really would prefer they didn't happen. Yeah. You know? That's when you need to ad lib. <laughs> well, it teaches you how to think on your feet and how to think quickly. And, and I can see how a lot of that could translate to managing an interview. And could you deal with a, a bunch of different personalities. Sometimes a guest will just give you the shortest answer possible and you've got to fill up the space. And sometimes they'll start rambling and you got to reel them back in. So all these things that you're mentioning, the radio, the TV, I can see how they're coming back. And those skills are very valuable for being in the podcast space. Yes, indeed. And well, here it's a bit ironic again, because as much as I love doing podcasting when we're audio, okay, yep. there's not a lot to worry about in preparation there and so on. But now, like you and I, we're doing a video. Yep. And I'm hoping to do a lot more video, right? But I'm not technical. Yeah. And I have this left brain, right brain thing. And for some reason, I'm scared of it all. Hmm. But I have to get over that. I have to learn to be able to do what I need to do to be able to produce what I want to produce. And that's doing more shows. You know, it's like doing TV shows, yeah, but doing them online instead okay. for streaming. Yeah. Right. I'd like to do that. Yeah. And that takes a little bit without having See, in the old days, Harry, it was the studios that, that made the money. You'd have to go to a studio to do a show and they'd have maybe a big green screen hanging in the corner. They might have, you know, or you would organize it a couple of nice settees mm -hmm. with a couple of trees, just, you know, false trees, but a nice little set, right? Yeah. Now, those days are gone. Everybody's gone online, you know, because COVID forced that. It started with Zoom, of course. Then there's all these other platforms that have come up and you can do all sorts of things that have cut out that studio. Yeah. And it's a little bit lonely in some ways, but if you're by yourself, but it's good if you can get a producer in with you to do the squitching. And if you're hosting a show, you don't have to worry about it then. You know what I mean? Yeah. But no, that's the future, I think. Don't you? Uh, no, actually, stuff? yeah. I mean, I think you. obviously everyone was forced into figuring out how to do this thing remotely post-COVID. And it's changed everything. There's no turning back. The genie's out of the bottle, right? Remote work. You know, people <laughs> are, are requesting that to work 100% from home. What you used to think, had to be done in a studio because of tools like Squadcast that we're using today. You can get high quality audio. You can record on, on location. And so I think it's forcing creators and podcasters specifically to adapt to this new way of doing things and also looking at it from an opportunity perspective, not a constriction or a limitation. Totally agree with you. How did you find it after all the years with audio then then going to video i actually started with video to believe it or not oh, did you really? back in 2014 skype was my tool of choice for recording but there was a Good old skype <laughs> there, was, there was a plug-in you could use called ecamm call recorder so right if you plugged it into Skype, you could watch the video of the person. You weren't, it wasn't recording video at the time, but I could have the audio conversation. So it was recording the audio while we're talking and I could see the person. And what I found, Mark, was just the ability to have that body language, the face-to-face -face interaction, and also building sure. the relationship because I would go to a podcast conference and people would see me in person and be like, hey, we just spoke for an hour. So I, you can make an impression on someone if you do a good job. And then it's for me, I realized from day one, I said, if I'm going to talk for an hour to this person, I want to build that relationship. You know, if, they, right. if it was just audio, they had no idea what I looked like, you know. And so I knew there was something in my brain that said, I want to build this relationship because of this time that I'm taking, that I'm investing in having this conversation. And I'm glad it paid off because it sort of helped me cut my teeth on having right. and being present because when it's video you can't be on a pad or you can't be fiddling around with something else you know you get distracted and you could ask someone a tough question if you hear silence on the other end you're like are you still there mark can you did you want me to repeat the question you know right, and sometimes right. people are just like they're thinking right what answer should i give harry should i give him the, the correct answer or should i give him the heartfelt answer you know right 
You know, you did right. And I remember he came, and I think about it now, you could see because the old saying of being able to, you know, look somebody in the eyes when you're talking to them. And yet it's ironic with this because I'm looking on my desktop, on my iMac, the big uh, little green light there, right? That's the camera. So I could look at your eyes directly. And yet I know below that I'm looking at the vision, mm -hmm. right? I can see you moving. But if I try to look down at you and look at your vision now, I'm, now I'm looking down. Yes. It's, it, it's, you've got to get adjust to this a little bit, haven't yeah, yeah, you? Yeah, you, know? you do. That's the whole thing. But no, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting. That's a beautiful sound you're coming through with. Is that a, a Shure? That's 7B? the Shure SM7B, yeah. yeah which yeah, which yeah. you might know I, from the radio days, I guess, maybe. <laughs> well, that beautiful microphone. I use a uh, podcast mic yeah. from, yeah, you know, the people that made the, the mixer. Yes. Oh, God, I forget the name for the moment. But Road. Me, right? Is it Road? Or... <laughs> Thank you. Road, there yeah. you go. Free plug for Road. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very nice microphone, very directional. But I think I'm going to get myself one of them, Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you. So uh, talk yeah. to me about the origins of the Mark Bishop show. Obviously, you've had the experience. You definitely put in your hours. You knew what you were doing. And I'm curious, you know, how you came up with the idea and, and what your thoughts were, you know, for the concept for your show when you first started? Well, I'd be lying if I said that I went out and founded a, a company in America. In fact, they're the biggest in what they do in communications. They actually contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in doing interviews. Now, these interviews are only 10 and 12 minutes, so they're short, which okay. I don't mind. Okay. But, and I said, of course I would be. The, the money with all due respect, isn't there, you know, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. And beggars can't be choosers. And I'm grateful for that. And when it got real, real busy there for a while, it'd be nothing for me to do seven, eight, ten of these a week. Oh, wow. And they were all in the morning because of the uh, Chicago or New York time difference of three hours. So I might be up at six or seven, but then I'm done. You know what I mean? Yeah. And... I was actually the first podcaster and the only podcaster that got these interviews to do while the rest of everybody were broadcasters or announcers on radio stations across America. So ironically, here I am podcasting wow. and doing those interviews, but I got such a lovely feedback from people. A lot of business people are really nice people. Uh, you know, the, the, the CEOs or the director of marketing or or uh, the owner of this company, whatever, yeah. if you did a good interview with them, and this is where it pays to do the work, as you're yeah. well aware, they were very, very impressed with the interviews and have since requested, you know, that I continue to do them. So that was a great thing. But of course, my own stuff with another one I do with nothing like a good book, I do that for nothing. Why? Because I'm trying to help authors yep. and good authors and you know, they're nobodies. They're, they're not uh, Tom Clancy's. Mm -hmm. But you know what? One of them has just done so well with his book that Hollywood's off. Well, provided Hollywood can get back together, yep. they've offered him a series, you know, like oh, um, nice. like J.K. What's her name? J.K. Rowling. Was that from Visibility on the Nothing Like a Good Book podcast? Did yes, I? it actually went off that and it was heard by a producer and the producer in turn chased up the author and good luck to him. I said, I want free tickets to the opening night. <laughs> I've always promised myself the red carpet, you know, yeah. without having to go out and buy one. I'd love to go to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> of course, we all would. I'm, yeah, I'm curious. I'm thing. curious about the jump because you said you were doing these short formats. Did you say seven minutes or twelve minutes? No, what no, it? ten to twelve minutes. Ten to twelve minutes of an quick in interviews there yeah. to the point, and, and much, that could be much, a long time. How much prep are you doing? Quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit for that, but it's worth it because I was being paid for it. Yeah. And again, you're doing something to try and build your brand. Yeah. And you're trying to, you know, because I look at it like I'm starting all over again, you know. Sure. This is a new industry. And although I've been going four years and teaching people downtown and they've got their business podcast for lead generation. Yeah. But then I do my own interviews and my own shows. But now going one step further is to where I love writing, you see, Harry. I've written a lot of documentaries and, and I'm about to do a book, but... I love writing short uh, short shows, okay. and I love producing them. And I'm really now trying to go after a market that businesses would love their own shows and their video, but they've also got an open and a close, and they've got mid rolls. Yeah. They've got guests on them. They, sure, sure. They've got maybe a spinning wheel on them. The whole thing's a giggle. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's an hour's TV show. <laughs> 
What did you notice about the difference when having to do those short form interviews and the amount of prep you had to do? And obviously, because it's a really tight time frame, there's not a lot of room for fluff there, I, I would imagine. How is that different from anything you had to shift your mindset on when it came to a longer form interview? Well, you have, obviously, the time is less. Yeah. You're trying to get to a point. Yeah. You want to get to the major points. Yeah. So you might think about, well, there's all that full page. Let me take only what I really want from that. Let me now do bullet points. Let me get to this. So if nothing else... The guy's happy that you've at least covered what the company wants to talk mm, about okay. and what you want to ask. Yeah. But at the same token, you were able to go open, identify who am I talking to, what gives you the right to be interviewed, mm. what's so good about it all, yeah. and let's close with it. What's the message? You know what I mean? Yeah, it it's, seemed that there would be a common thread there in such a short period of time. You have to very quickly establish the credentials of this guest in a way that may, keeps the listener engaged. And you have to show their value in such a short period of time. And then I'll give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about themselves and then close. It's you know, I'm just interesting because I obviously I, I try to keep these within 45 to two minutes to an hour. But that's a lot of time for us to have a lot of, you know, back and forth conversation, <laughs> especially, you know, we've talked about your history as well. But you can't not a lot of time for fluff <laughs> in that. No, in that, in no. That short and window. how are we doing? Are we over the hour yet? No, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Do you feel but, but there's a point there that you brought up, mate, yeah. that's very important. Yeah. There are podcasts that are three hours long. Sure. Yeah. And there are ten minute podcasts. Yep. Right? But it seems to be, from what I'm reading of late, and more and more stats are coming out and points of view and so on, but forty five minutes seems to be the settling point yeah. at the moment. I mean what do you think about that? I heard someone describe it once because this is a common question for podcasters, you know, how long should a podcast be? And someone said something that I thought was really insightful. It should be as long as it takes to keep, it should be as long as it takes to keep the listener's interest in the topic. And so if you're doing a five minute show, it's a new show. That's what you signed up for. So you're going to get interchained. But if you have a Joe Rogan show and it's three hours and I'm still listening after two and a half hours, well, good on that host and good on Joe for keeping me engaged or keeping me laughing or keeping because it's, you know, yeah. matter, it's I always say it's it can be enlightening, educating or entertaining, you know, and I might be missing another one. But you have to get something out of it. And I'm always conscious of that in my conversations with guests that I keep the conversation going. I keep it entertaining or educating or enlightening for the listener. I'm always conscious of that. I always talk about the three people in a conversation, the guest, the host and the listener. And I never forget that we have a, one listener singular at a time. And this is important because everyone's listening with their earbuds in. So you're not on stage. And a lot of times public speakers, they come on podcasts and they're like, hey, everyone, what's going on? Welcome to, you know, and, and you can probably speak to, you know, how that experience is on radio and TV. But I think what I've heard some earlier okay. guidance about really thinking about that one listener, you know, because it's really one person listening to us having this conversation at a time and we're always conscious of it. And so if there's something specific that I don't think they'll understand or listen to or know the definition of, I'll ask my guest, I'll say, hey, hey, Mark, for the benefit of the listener, can you explain what that concept means or where in Australia you were referring to? And I found that makes it like a more intimate conversation because it, they are, it's, a, it's an intimate medium, right? People are listening. They're well, on, it's very they're on much walk. so an intimate medium. They're, they're yeah. walking, I mean, every, walking a dog, every... you know? How many times over your career in podcasting have you had to explain to a client, an advertiser, a sponsor, somebody that uh, would like to back you in one way or another? Look, the reality is you can spend it on radio generically or television. Sure. They may have 20, 30, 40,000 listeners at that given time. Yeah. But you might be lucky if a quarter of a quarter of a percent are even interested in what you're talking about. Yeah. The beauty of podcasting is, look, I've only got 300 followers. I've only got 3,000 followers, but they're all intentional listeners. Oh, yeah. And they all love what, you know, the show is about. And, yes, they flitter about a little bit, but mostly they always follow me because they like what they hear. And that's how you're building your scenario. I mean, if I'm ever jealous of one guy, I think it's Rogan. There's no doubt about it. I love a show like he's doing. But, of course, you had to be a comedian first or some big brand. And look at the budgets that he gets. Of course, he's going to get superstars and, mm -hmm. and people to be able to interview, isn't he? He's going to get them all the time. The only thing I found difficult with him with podcasting was all the swearing. <laughs> I yeah. had a 40-year career. If I swore once like that, I'd be fired yeah. immediately. 
Well, know? that's the beauty of podcasting and how things have changed because you can say whatever the hell you want, and people. Uh, and, and if it's not for you, then you, it repels people as fast as attraction. Because for some people, that's how people normally speak to their friends, and they feel like they have to put on airs to be. You know, we're in right. polite company, so maybe we can't say shit and damn. But <laughs> hey, if you want to, I I'm let talking guess, about worse than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. No, but you, you've got to be yourself, and I agree yeah. with that. And that is the beauty of it. But I think in time. I don't know who who can control this lot with podcasting, but I think in time the big finger will come down on that too. But that's the beauty of podcasting. There is no big finger. People have tried it with Joe. They tried to quote unquote cancel him. You can't. I think what's so amazing, and I was talking about some to this someone earlier today, is we're at a point now because of podcasting that if if you want to have a topic about whatever fringe topic you want and you know for the most part you'll find your little audience and they'll listen to it and it may be a small show but maybe or maybe a big show like joe's but if you like the topic and you want to it's hard to bs you you've been on tv you know you invite a guest on and they put on their best airs and they give you the three minute snippet the exact talking points and they can tell you exactly you don't know anything about this person they're just showing you their best face you put someone on a podcast for three hours, it's really hard to BS for three hours. I'll get a good idea of whether you're full of crap or not. So That's right. I just love that ability to just kind of go deep on these topics. And, you know, it's instead of buyer beware, it's listener beware. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen. Yes, <laughs> but clearly exactly he's hitting right. a nerve because it's the number one show for a reason. Well, there you go. Yeah. And the other fellow who I listen to, uh, I listen to PBS a bit, but in the car, you know, fuzzy wuzzy been around for years not jerry seinfeld or... <laughs> no 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 as a matter of fact i saw him the other night in tucson doing a show oh, okay and i was in the front row and it was it was terrific to see him. he's a very talented guy mind you the guy he had on before him opening the show was even better oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. out of nothing that show good on him anyway so i'm curious what prompted you to start the second show nothing like a good book like what was the itch you were scratching there well i'm not a great reader but I do want to write, and I have written a lot. Got it. I've written four shows that I want to produce, put on air, okay. like we're doing now, only okay. these shows, and get them sponsored. Okay. That's the next challenge is learning how to go after the right sponsor in America for the right show. Okay. But how do you sell a show if you don't have thousands of listeners? So it's very much got to be, you know, hopefully they can see that it will get listeners or viewers but i think that people can write very good books and i think you can learn from whom you interview these interviews are 30 minutes long and you can go right into a book i don't read the full book i praise it and you often get with the books of course press releases and other materials and these days what they're doing which probably you know about anyway, they're doing a lot of video links to actually promote the book. Okay. So that's being seen too, you know, on Amazon and other places yeah. like that. But I enjoy helping them get promoted to hopefully sell a few. Makes sense. And I learn from it, why they wrote the book and how they went about it. So maybe one day I'll get a sponsor for the show. Yeah. And it'll be worthwhile doing all the effort and all the work because there's only X amount of hours in a day. I know. And if you're doing too much free stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, how are you paying the bills? <laughs> you love it, but hey. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Because the Minister for War and Finance gets a bit upset, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so for the work that you do with clients, who would you say is an ideal person for you to work with, given all the experience you had? I'm sure there's like a sweet spot of people who you enjoy working with and who enjoy working with you because they can leverage all your years of uh, radio and TV experience? Oh, man, that's a tough question because the way I do my podcast downtown, so to speak, mm -hmm. is geared at businesses, small business. Their objective is only to get more business. Okay. And when I meet them and they start with me and they say, gee, how long before I get 5,000 listeners? You know, mm. how many will I get such and such? Yeah, Whoa. Yeah. yeah. None. Absolutely none. What do you mean none? You start with none, and unless you do what I tell you to do, you'll end up with none. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But seriously, yeah. if you really want to get more business, then I go into all my parallel, I do my whiteboard, I'm going to cut long story short, 
I've got clients, buddy, that are running at 418% return of investment over what they've spent with me yeah. in four years. Nice. So I must be doing something right. The ones that have success, what's the common thread there? Prepared to work. Okay. That's good. Bottom line, prepared yeah. to work. And prepared to just give that little bit extra. Because if you don't, I mean, I know things have changed. People quit during COVID. People had awakenings. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I just want to go out and do what I want to do. Follow your dream and the money mm -hmm. will come. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you've got to... You've got to be, you've still got to be prepared to work. There are no shortcuts. Your mom and dad were right. Your granddad was right. You've got to be honest with yourself in life and work. Yeah. Right. And if you do that, then there's a good chance the money will come. Would you agree with that, Harry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I always, people talk about luck and I always say that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, I like that yeah. one. Yeah. 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 And can you see that commitment to doing the work? early or do you see it over the course of how, when they start working with you or, or are there questions you ask them like how is there something that you can identify early in the process yes we sit down i give free consultation i try to get right into the brain of who they are what they really want what their goals are never mind just talk to me about goals anybody can talk about goals mm -hmm. prove to me that you really want these goals interesting right put them on the whiteboard but I don't know who to do. But I don't know how to go about it. Let's just work it through and talk about it, okay? Because this is what I would be commanding of you. This, this, and this. Are you prepared to do it? Mm. Oh, my God. It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> well, well, I'm sorry, Mary. I'm sorry, John. Yeah. I can't guarantee you results then mm. because it's a 50-50. It's a quid pro quo. Yeah, yeah. You Good put point. in, I put in. Yeah. Together, we'll achieve it. If I try and be you, I can't. You've got to be you, but you've got to take from me what I can teach you to be you, to get what you want to get, yeah. if we work together. And, you know, sometimes I get accused of being too hard, too nasty, too this, too that. Listen, at the end of the day, all I care about is winning. All I care about is getting the job done. Yeah. Talk about it later with your mates in the pub or somewhere else. They put you down, prove to them then. Look what I made this month. What did you make? Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't let people stop you. Drive at it. Go for it. Be yourself. And if you're young, you're lucky. Because, you know, it doesn't take long before you're my age, I'm telling you. It just creeps up on you. They're right when they yeah. talk about that. Yeah. I wish this podcasting was around, Harry, 40 years ago. Me too. Me too. I really do. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hear you. Ah, oh, dear, oh, dear. They're so lucky the kids are today, but never mind. But, and... You've got to be honest with yourself. It means if you go to work during the day, you've got to do it. If you're running a business during the day, yeah. these people are tired. But by the end of the day, they don't want to be working on something else or preparing. Well, that's where that drive comes in. That's, that's where that push comes in. Yeah. And if you do do that, it's soon going to be that you won't have to put as much time into it because you're ahead of the game. You've learned shortcuts. You know what to do. Yeah. Right? And you've got to keep pushing then you can afford to quit the job or do what you want to do and go that way, you know. Makes sense. Look at me. I mean, I've come out of retirement. Yeah. I've still got goals I want to do. It's extremely hard to be in radio and television 40 years and do nothing. Yeah. You yeah. can't play golf every day. <laughs> you know, there's especially, something that's especially in the heat. <laughs> Not in the heat anyway. Yeah. But I'm talking professionally. Yeah. It's very hard. There's tons of jocks out there around the world. Sure. There's tons of major news anchors on television. There's oh, yeah. station hosts. There's guys that have had shows. Keep going for your bucket list. As a matter of fact, Harry, I had one on the bucket list for the States that I'd never achieved. 20 years on and off living here. And last weekend, I went for a part in a movie. I want, you know, the acting bit. It's taken years to get yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I went for a small part. Quite happy to do that that I'd achieved for the bucket list. Okay. Not to be a superstar or anything. Just Sure. I don't care if I walked on, dropped the tray and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> but I got this small part. Awesome. They were wrapped. And so much so, they asked me to read for the lead. Very nice. And guess who got the lead? You did. <laughs> I did. That's and that's great. without any experience or big name or no other, you know, no Nicole Kidman or no... 
what's his name? Lots of Tom Cruise. <laughs> Jackman out of Australia. I'm a nobody. <laughs> yeah. I'm nobody, baby. Yeah, but here's, the thing. here's where it comes full circle. Preparation meets opportunity. Spot on. You were prepared. By oh, gee, that's a good statement. Yeah, yeah. So it's. Can, so I, can it, I use that? Yeah, you told me on that. <laughs> that's very nice of you. See, he's a lovely bloke. He shares everything. Yeah, yeah. And so no, make sure you, 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 you let us know what that movie is and we can put a link to it. I will. Show it's nothing. called An Eye for an Eye. Okay. And, uh, and ironically, the lead is the head of Mafia. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And oh. I've got to wear a beautiful 1930s three-piece, like okay. a Teflon bloody Don, okay. and, and a hat that goes with it, right? So it comes back to full circle to getting whacked. Um, <laughs> See, I'm paying attention. <laughs> hey, don't give up your day job, but not bad, not yeah, bad. Okay. Have you ever wanted to be a comedian? I appreciate comedy, and I can tell a, a good joke if in the right circumstances. But it, it I is... forget them. I got yeah. thousands of them, but I forget them. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. You know, I, but I would have loved to have shot at, at stand up for a little while. Yeah, just it, for it's, it's a skill, and I, I love to hear oh, when, boy, when Joe, when it, when it, Joe really? talks about it, or when he's a comedian now, and they talk about the art of comedy. And it's really like when you see someone do it well, it's really amazing that they can do that for forty five minutes for a set and just keep you laughing the whole time. Yeah, that's why I was surprised when I watched Seinfeld live in Tucson. He actually had uh, prompt little cards. Yeah, he was probably learning new material. He was probably practicing some new stuff. That's what they do, yeah. You know, is that yeah. what they do? And he walks back to the stool, you know, yeah. while he's controlling you, and then goes back and a little flip, and, oh, yeah, I'll go down this road. You yeah, know? yeah, he's working new <laughs> so, material then, probably. Yeah, yeah, very good, but it's an art. There's no doubt yeah. about it. And I've noticed another thing about the U.S., Harry. Every Tonight Show host or what have you was a comedian. Oh, yeah. That's right. Beforehand. It's like the producers go out and only look for yeah. comedians at the They're looking for clubs personalities, yeah. Before they'll give you a chance to host a show, yeah. right? Or something else. So, yeah, interesting. But what have been some of your goals? I mean, have you achieved everything you want to do, basically? No, I think I'm always striving to improve myself and my business and my shows, just learning new things. I'm trying to learn more about passive investing. Just, I don't want to be working a job forever. I want to see if there's opportunities to, whether it's real estate or and stuff that's brand new to me. I've never, you know, I've yeah, been watching courses and just learning because acquiring, you know, this idea of building wealth has been fascinating for me and how most people see it as something that's only available to the rich, but they got that way because they educated themselves on how to understand the tax code better or, or how to make investments that sort of like provide passive income. And so it's been interesting for me to try to start to dabble in that world a little bit. And I'm out of my comfort zone when I do that. But I realize that sometimes that's how like podcasting, I was out of my comfort zone in 2014. So I think in terms of like this idea of building wealth has been important because it's something that I had to learn on my own. I, I didn't, I'm not from a wealthy family and it's interesting how people you know me either, right. who, who get to that point, you know, there's things that they do. And when you read these books about how the rich stay rich and, you know, sometimes it's important to kind of like learn the rules of the game. And so I'm, I'm super early days. So if you see me start another podcast around passive income, then that's probably, <laughs> I'll that's show probably you a good idea. I mean, yeah. I that's a very important point you brought up because if there's people listening that want to think they want to start a show and do all the rest of it see my mistake was well not a mistake but i sort of fell into just doing business interviews okay and talking to executives and promoting companies and promoting businesses per se from down that angle right i never really until i started nothing like a good book there wasn't anything that i wanted to do from yeah. a point of view of what am I interested in? What do I really want to talk about? Yeah. You know, what sort of show could I really do? Because it's very different from doing that. And that's why I want to do these other shows that I've written. But I find the one thing that I find that is very detrimental to me, and maybe your listeners can take a lesson out of this. I don't think I'm Robinson Crusoe in doing this, but I tend to get, uh, what do you call a not shiny object? Like you, I am trying to learn other things. Yeah. In passive investment. And, you know, some of it's for me, some of it's not. You buy these things in real estate, this and that. There's so many people pushing so much stuff. And then there's the newsletters. There's a name for it. But someone told me the other day, but I forget. It's about all these dudes that are in giving you the right, you know, ticker to invest in. And yeah, you get the newsletters. Yeah. You've got to pay them 49 bucks, And then yeah. it's nine seventy nine. And you don't know who to believe anymore. You just don't know who I to believe I think what the most important you know. skill anyone can learn is discernment. And being able to, 
it's a hard one because you're basically learning how to figure out what's BS and what's not. And yep. so it's something that, you know, being able to look at things and with a, a curious eye, but also a discerning eye and ear to say, is this person full of shit or is it, are they really teaching me? Do they have proof? Can I look at something that they've done? Does it sound too good to be true? And usually what it is, but right. definitely right, exactly. going to be learning more about that. And probably my listeners will be hearing more about this. But as we wrap up, I have a, just a couple more questions that I like to ask. What is something you've changed your mind about recently? Ooh. What is something I've changed my mind about? I tend to wander a little okay. bit. I get caught. The thing wrong with working from home or on your own is you've got no one to keep balances, checks and balances. Sure, sure. And I find myself, unfortunately, getting sucked in with too many emails. Yep. And I'm trying to learn. And I'm always watching. I'm always open-minded, this and that, this and that. But all of a sudden, I go from 200 a day to 300 a day. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, if I buy something, well, there's another 300 come in from the same sort of related. Oh, but we don't sell your information. We don't give it away to anybody third party. And they, well, how could you get... And I find myself going through all my emails and it's lunchtime. <laughs> you don't get anything done. And, and that's the biggest thing for me is I've got to learn to turn off, get yeah. away from Unsubscribe. it. Unsubscribe. <laughs> Get back out in the street, 112 degree heat, go knock on some doors. That'll change you. Yeah. <laughs> but what you is, know what I mean. You can I get do. sucked into that. Yeah. You know? What is the most misunderstood thing about you? Well, I'm a Pisces. Um, <laughs> I am a giver and I'd do anything for anybody. But I can come across terribly hard when it comes to business. Yeah. And because I care so much about the person who's paying me not to let them down makes sense. and to make sure they're successful or to yeah. make sure the client gets the results he expects, you know, or to make sure that he gets the product sold that he really wanted to do. Yeah. So from a podcasting point of view or a teaching point of view for me, I can be, you know, seen as too hard and misunderstood what my goal is for them. You know, yeah. so I now say at the very beginning, to be very honest with you, you sure you want to work with me? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, see that axe on the wall? <laughs> well, I think it's helpful. And then there's a whip over there. <laughs> there's people to know what they're signing up for. But I think the listeners have gotten a feel for your personality because it definitely shines through in this conversation. And they know, and I get the sense that when people first meet you, if they don't know anything about you, you might come off as, as a bit gruff. But I think people who over time have gotten to hear you know how you approach life and because of your life experiences I, I think that's when they start to resonate with you and that's when they start to feel that you're either for them or you're not for them and they, they can quickly figure that out and I, and I appreciate you sharing your stories on the show today I'm honored to I've been a fan of uh, podcast junkies and uh, your other things that you do and you for a long long time so I'm being honored thank you so yeah. much yeah and I'm glad we finally made this happen and I think at right place right time I think we've been in touch for several years and it's been interesting to kind of just stay in touch. And when you reached out, I thought the best way to catch up is on the show. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing your very, very interesting journey, which is going to be inspiring as well. So That's good. I hope so, Harry. <laughs> yes. Life's too short otherwise, mate. Yeah. You go look after them chooks, mate. <laughs> Have you got llamas yet? You've got to get llamas too. Llamas, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's next. Where, where's the best place for folks to connect with you and learn more about what you're working on? Just go to markbishopmedia.com. Okay. And we'll dub, 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 markbishopmedia.com. That's Mark with a K, too. Okay. And we'll make sure those links are in the show notes, uh, and we'll, we'll get that all squared away as well. So I appreciate your time yeah. again, Mark. Thank uh, you. I got it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, Harry. Take care. You too.